We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Weird, better known by fans of the show as Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. Though that joke doesn't quite work as well as it used to. Well, Weird asks, what hidden gems are out there? More specifically, what games don't have any coverage that you think are definitely worthy of the spotlight? Well, thanks for the question, Weird. Uh, this is a good one. Now, while they are asking for games that don't get any coverage, that's pretty much the rare game indeed. I can't think of a game in my collection that doesn't have at least a little bit buzz going around, at least with a certain small groups, unless I start to get into obscure indie RPGs like Triple X Street Luge. Now, what we are going to share are um, a number of games, 15 games I think we got to, that we see as hidden gems, and then a few honorable mentions that I couldn't decide if they fit on the list for one reason or another. Now, these are games that aren't getting enough attention or that people may have completely missed. Yeah, to me, a hidden gem is that game that you find yourself telling everyone about because somehow it slipped under the radar. The mm -hmm. game that you know is a winner, but no one else has heard of. Yeah, I can also see it as when I'm listening to a podcast and they mention it and you're like, yes, no one talks about that game. I get quite a few of those. I'm like, oh, it's awesome. You also discovered that awesome game and you're telling people about it. It is so awesome to hear you talk about that. Yes, you're you're part of the team, right? You get that kind of team spirit going with some of these games. You're like rooting for the underdog. I guess it's the same feeling. Although when you do hear about it, hear about it on the other podcast, it becomes less of a, a hidden gem every time yeah, you hear it on the podcast. That's true. <laughs> if, you, if you hear it on one other podcast, cool. And you start hearing about all of them, I, you can still be happy. I'm still like, yes, other people have discovered this awesome game. But yes, it's no longer a hidden gem at that point once everyone talks about it. Though I guess our list tonight are all games we hope that'll happen with. Absolutely. And one thing we actually noticed building this list is sometimes it's uh, sort of chronological. So a game may have gotten a bit of buzz uh, early on mm -hmm. uh, and then disappeared into obscurity while it's still a great game and possibly even still available to buy. Uh, it has fallen off everyone's radar. Yeah, I'm thinking we could possibly do a completely, well, there would be some overlap, but another list of like forgotten games, mm -hmm. games we used to love, yeah. where, where, where games everyone was hyped about, but no one talks about anymore. Not even necessarily us. Like yeah. for us, that's, that's but, Azul, but, but I'm that, thinking like in general. Yeah, yeah. Games that were the big, a big deal for 15 minutes and disappeared. So... I think it's time to get to our list. I did double check. So we have 13. So what's 13? I couldn't remember what number we stopped at. 13 games and then some honorable mentions as well. All right. Well, on to the games. As usual, this list is in no particular order. All right. So my number one is a game I would have never heard of, except I had reached out to Rio Grande Games when we were hosting Extra Life Gaming events. And during our Extra Life events, I wrote out to a bunch of companies and I said, hey, are you willing to donate games either for our group to play during Extra Life and we'll share pictures on social media or to put into our auction where we'll raise money for charity? One of those games, uh, Rio Grande in particular, sent a bunch of demo copies. And it was interesting because they showed up with stickers that said, not for sale, this is a demo copy. And one of those games is Tiffin. Now, Tiffin is about a South Asian tradition of delivering Tiffins, which is a certain type of lunch tray, to people at businesses they are, where there are Tiffins that go onto the back of these little scooters and they bring them to people at lunch and then people have hot lunches. To fit this, this is a pickup and deliver game where you are trying to deliver Tiffins to different um, sites. You put three sites out and you try to deliver Tiffins to them. And you're, what you're doing is filling in cubes on a bar and it's kind of an area control thing. So it's kind of like the smash up bases, but instead you're delivering hot food to office spaces. It is a really unique game that almost no one is talking about, no one's heard of. And honestly, I would have completely missed had Rio Grande not sent this. Now, I don't know if someone at Rio Grande was like, oh, we have a thousand copies of Tiffin, send that. <laughs> or if they were like, no, more people have to try this because it's really good. Fair enough. Uh, I, it's The Tiffin is, and that's the the Indian. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, the Indi Indian yeah. lunch delivery. Yes. Um, fantastic. Uh, fantastic you know, way of doing things, honestly. It's it's the, yeah. the, it's, it's something that would, would benefit uh Everyone, if it, if it happened in more places than just in India. No, honestly, I agree. Uh, but that was Tiffin. Now, I don't know if, how we didn't discuss how we were going to talk about this, but what I thought was interesting is 
when I put the list together and Sean and I kind of worked together on this one, uh, we also noted down how many ratings the game had on Board Game Geek. So I think I want to call that out for each game as well, just to show how much, how hidden these gems are. So how hidden is Tiffin? <laughs> yeah, too. well, Tiffin, 106 people rated That's Tiffin. It. That's it. That's all. It, one's <laughs> me. <laughs> Um, and that is a staggeringly low number. As yes. you'll come to see, as the list moves on, you'll see a, you'll see a, a wide variance of what we considered. Uh, but again, some of these being older games might have will have higher numbers just because of the age. And eventually, someone's going to play play it once or twice and rate it. Yep. And again, that was Tiffin with 106 ratings on Board Game Geek. Next up, we have one of our show favorites, and I think people mm -hmm. who listened, it's not a hidden gem to anyone who listens to this show, True. but outside of that, the fantastic Go Cuckoo, which so many people overlook as that kid's game, mm -hmm. you know, something, maybe even like an Easter game, something that, you know, comes out seasonally or, or is just, you know, around every once in a while, you know, let kids play it at the holidays, but is such a strategic and tricky <laughs> dexterity game that's totally worthy of being a hobby player's game. And yet only a thousand people have actually managed to rate it on board game geek. Yeah, this is, this is one everyone. I, again, I would have overlooked this one if it were not for T who showed me the game in the Haba booth at origins. Like, and then I also had to give props to Wayne Humfleet, the star Wars guy who said, go see T at the Haba booth. Cause she'll show you this go cuckoo game. Yeah. That, that, it's it's such a, a strange game that's easy to overlook for various reasons. The small little canister that it's in, uh, the colorful, childish nature, the fact that Haba does do a lot of games for younger kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, Gokuku isn't necessarily one of those. Next, I have uh, a game I have never, ever heard anyone else talk about, and that is La Boca which I now learned today has been reprinted under a new name. So that's fascinating to me. And I'm wondering if more people will get to hear about this game. This is a group party game where you play through a round robin tournament, pairing up with each other player twice to try to build buildings that look like the apartments in La Boca. But you're doing this with wood wooden cubes. You each sit on either side of the board. Then you put a card that shows what the buildings look like from your side. Your opponent has what the buildings look like from their side. You then have to work together to get these blocks so that both of yours are right. Then you slam a buzzer saying you're accurate. The other players check to see um, if you did it right. And if you did, you get points based on how quick you were able to do this. This is one of the most raucous player uh, party games I own. This gets a crowd going. It gets people yelling, high-fiving. I don't think I've ever done the sports belly bump in a board game except in La Boca because we were 0.3 seconds quicker than the last team. Fair enough. Now, admittedly, some people aren't into that kind of rocket well, no. game, uh, and that could keep it off some people's radar, but definitely sounds like a fun one and fun enough that at least 2,000 people have heard of it before. And that was La Boca. Now, next up, again, one that we have been singing the praises of, but it's clear that the word hasn't yeah. gotten out wider, and that's mm -hmm. Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, a deck builder that has so many new and interesting twists and usages that actually match the theme and work with the IP. It's not just another Dominion with the IP slapped on top. Uh can't really say enough good things about Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, but only 518 people seem to have noticed it. Yeah, I, I gotta admit, I don't remember if I rated this one myself. <laughs> but yes, fantastic game. I really like this one. And as a call out, because why wouldn't we? You can win a copy of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade in our giveaway right now. Thank you, Japanime Games. Absolutely. Uh, next, I have one that when I was brainstorming this list, when I was putting the list together, I I was like, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I totally missed it. And then I went downstairs to build our backdrop, as I do for all our podcast episodes, and fill the Cadillacs behind me. And I'm like, oh, Rail Pass. No one's heard of Rail Pass. No one knows this game exists. 
Uh, sure enough, only 323 people have ever rated it. So it's a little more well known than Tiffin, but that is not a high number of, of, of ratings. Now, this is a pick up and deliver train game where you pick up and deliver trains. And this is long before Trader Mechanic, the Trader Mechanic game came out or Deck Builder, the deck building game. It doesn't even say that on the cover. But that's actually what it is. And I think it's brilliant. You are literally loading little cubes onto plastic trains and passing them to other players. And well, if there's a train tunnel between you and the other player, you actually have to pass it through the tunnel even like uh, it's such a great game. It's a it's a real time game. Not going to be for everyone. If you drop your train, there's rules for that. If cubes fall off is all part of it. And really, when you get to the end of it, it's actually just a puzzle where you're trying to sort the cubes into the right colors. It is so much fun. Again, I get it. Not for everyone. But anyone who doesn't mind a real-time timed game, put it this way, Deanna hates real-time games. She doesn't love Rail Pass, but she likes it and is willing to play it. Yeah, I think I think this one is is niche, but even being as niche as it is, there's still there should be more notice to, given to this game than it's gotten so far. Yeah. Uh and uh so next up I've got Draconis Draconis Invasion. Now, this is a really fun Dominion-esque deck building game uh, that's got some real strong points. And while it's not perfect, and we've talked about how dark the art in it is, mm -hmm. uh, overlooking the art, uh, it's got some really interesting timing mechanics uh, that gives you a sense of tension building mm -hmm. in the game and make for a very nice twist on Dominion with that fantasy uh, style rather than the, the more Euro stylings mm -hmm. of dominion itself uh and has got some expansion so you've got quite the card not not nearly as many as the dominion might have yeah, and nothing no. has as many expansions as dominion <laughs> so uh it, it gives you quite the uh, the number of campaigns and ways to play that uh, draconis invasion and yet only 544 people seem to have cared yeah i think we called this one a hidden gem when we did our review and then we did a kickstarter preview for the uh, the, the we did a review of the one expansion that adds a campaign and then a Kickstarter preview for the other one that adds asymmetric powers. Uh, well, the neat part about this is it's Dominion, but it's kind of like Dominion mixed with Thunderstone because there's a building up your power to kill monsters thing. And that's where it really stands out. Otherwise, it's one of the only static market games that I really enjoy. Like for deck builders, I usually stay away from that, but it works in this game. And that was Traconis Invasion. Next, I have a game that I thought was out of print because it was put out by TMG Games, which sadly um, is no more. Uh, but thankfully, other companies are starting to pick up their games. This one did have quite a few ratings on Board Game Geek at 3000, but I don't see anyone ever talking about Gold West. This is a Euro. I like, yes, the theme is your mining, but is a Euro that uses a mechanic that it ends up I love and I wouldn't have predicted, and that is Moncala. Uh, very few games use this. You got Five Tribes, you got Trajan, and you got Gold West. There's probably others, but those are all good ones where I love it. Gold West is a game where you are picking a spot on the board and then putting resources over onto your um your like different bins, and then you're gonna sorry, it's sorry to turn, you're gonna you're gonna take your resources and all your bins, you're gonna pick a bin. You're going to pick everything up and you're going to drop one piece and each bin going down. And what's left over, it tells you what you can do, whether that's go mining or build resources and everything else. Then it's all area control and Euro and there's a, a, a tracks with carts you're trying to move up and all this other stuff. And it does your usual Euro point salad stuff. But I really liked Gold West. That was a big hit for my group. I got to thank Lance, Lance Mixter, the Undead Viking. For coming out to me in Origins and going, you got to try this and handing me a copy when he worked at TMG. So I 3,000 people is not enough for this game. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a TMG game here. This wasn't yeah. like some niche Kickstarter. This is a, this is a, a major market game that only got 3,000 people to pay attention to it. And that is Gold West. Now, next up is one, again, we've sung the praises of many times, but is still not apparently getting out there enough. So people, no. why are you not playing Gorinto? Now, this is just a fantastic game that's simple enough to, to set up and play, has some great components to it, uh, and yet has a huge variety of ways mm -hmm. to play and give it a giant amount of replayability. 
Uh, they say Garinto should have a lot more than 757 ratings on it. And talking like that is why Mark Spector is one of the sponsors of our <laughs> giveaway. No, the game is that good. It really is. I, I love Garinto. I, I listened to someone else complain that it was too samey, and I just don't get it. I, I don't get it. Like to me, that's like saying Azul's too samey. Why would I want to play it multiple times? I, I don't I don't see it, but we are definitely fans, and more people need to pick up Garinto. Now you can get it at Barnes and Noble with an exclusive expansion, so you don't even have an excuse that you can't find it anymore. That was Gorinto, reviewed by only 757 people. The next one I have is shocking to me. It's Strasbourg. Only 2.7 people. And when I say Strasbourg, I don't... 1,000 people. 1,000 people, sorry. <laughs> no. Well, two and a half people <laughs> rated it. 2.7 so. people. You would not believe what we did to that third yes, person to get that That third rating. person did just terrible. We, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so Strasbourg, the thing is, I'm saying this, and I doubt there's a lot of people at their homes going, yeah, Strasbourg, why is no one talking about that? Because no one's talking about it. This is this is a Stefan Feld. It's a Feld. How, how are people not talking about it? This is a game where you have an auction, then you have an auction, then you have another auction, then another auction, then another. And I think you do 38 different auctions all to win majorities in different areas and place people on your board. Oh, wait, I said Steffenfeld. Do I really need to get into all the ways you can get points? There's lots. Have things in the corner. Match the patterns. Own all of the things. And all at the same time, you're vying for seats in the House of Commons thing up at the top. I, I is a fantastic. It's actually one of my favorite Felds. And no one ever talks about this game. I don't even know where I got it. I think I got it when Geektropolis Cafe closed. And I picked it up because it said Stefan Feld on the cover. And I was like, why is no one talking about this game? I mean, this was a Spiel des Jahres Kenner Spiel nominee. I mean, but it was 2011. And I think possibly it just came out a little bit too long ago. And, 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 and just sort of caught the, the beginning of the hobby board game rush. Uh, or at least the current hobby board <laughs> game rush. Uh, and so that's why Strasbourg hasn't gotten quite the love that it might. Now, next up, I've got one with 2.4 thousand likes, which seems like a lot, except those likes all came or those ratings all came from a pretty niche group, I'm betting. Mm -hmm. And that's Minecraft Builders and Biomes. And I think a lot of Minecraft people heard about this because it was, you know, it was even featured on the big Minecraft annual show. Oh, wow. Um, they, they did push it, uh, towards some Minecraft people, but I think the, the overlap of circles between Minecraft and board gamers isn't quite as large as they hoped it was. Mm -hmm. Cause the problem is this is actually a good game. Mm -hmm. If you ignore the fact that it's Minecraft, because you don't have to have ever played Minecraft to play this game. It is still a solid game that requires a lot of forethought. You're, you're working in, there's three rounds to the game. You need to plan for your third round while you're still working to win, to, to you know, score points in the first round. Uh, there's a whole lot of, of sort of, it, it's, well, I mean, it's Euro enough that it's, it's mostly mm -hmm. single player solitaire, but you can, there is some hate drafting and, and things that can go on. So it's not like there's no interaction between players. There's just no direct action against right. players. Um, but you know, my family loves this game. I know your family loved this game. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, and there has been at least one expansion, probably yeah. even two. Yeah. Uh, there's at least one. I don't know yeah. about two. Uh, and so I realist really Minecraft builders and biomes, whether you like Minecraft or not is definitely worth giving a look. at. So, so there was a set of promo tiles and one expansion. Ah, okay. So that's, that's what it's out there a fishing rod and something else. Yeah, this one was good. Um, I will admit, I gave my copy to Sean because his kids probably enjoy it more than mine would. And I think that's true. Uh, my girls did enjoy it, though. They both liked it. They love the cube. Like mm -hmm. the fact you build this brick that you mine to play, which nice and thematic. They did like this game. That was Minecraft Builders and Biomes, not to be at all confused with Minecraft the card game. Stay no, away from that. No, do not go <laughs> near Minecraft the card game. <laughs> Run away from that. Life. That is a for a totally different list about things buried in the rough, <laughs> deep, deep in the rough. <laughs> All right, I totally get this one. 
I totally understand why it only has 1.7k rating. Actually, I'm surprised it, it should have 12,000 ratings of people complaining. And that is the master of Orion, the board game. The thing is, this is not a 4x Twilight Imperium Eclipse like game. It should be. The name Master of Orion belongs on a big epic game with tons of miniatures and tons of ships and random elements and politics. No, instead, this is a rapid fire, very quick playing under an hour engine building card game, kind of like Race for the Galaxy without the bidding for what job you're doing or what turn you're taking. You're building your tableau. You can attack other players. When you attack other players, they can retaliate. You can only get so many points for attacking. So that's why. So it's balanced out. So it's not all about who wins, whoever has the biggest forces. This is actually a really good sci-fi tableau builder. But it says Masters of Orion on it. Even more importantly, they labeled two of the races backwards. So if you are a hardcore Master Orion fan, you're already upset it's not the 4X you want. And then they got core lore wrong. So I get why it's a, it's a hidden gem and why people aren't buying this. But I swear if this game just said Master of Pluto or Master of whatever, the Venus Nebula, it probably would have did great. Well, and I, you know what? I think that this is the kind of game where there's enough people out there who don't know Masters of Orion anymore that could probably enjoy it because they don't know the uh, the origins and they won't notice yes. that there is there yep. are problems with the lore. So uh, if you I'll could admit, get a copy, I did not notice that part. I did not notice that someone else online pointed that out. It's like, oh, I'd like the game, but I can't believe they screwed up the Zinti and the. And I'm like, okay, I was a huge Mass Ryan fan, but no. By the time I played this, I that was gone from my head. Right, fair enough. Well, that was the Master of Orion, the board game. Now, next up is another one of uh, our our favorites that you you unfortunately can't get right now. No, we keep praying and we keep plugging away on Twitter, hoping that someone will take up the mantle and let us get be, let people be able to buy a copy of. But wait, there's more, which is a such a fantastic game from friends of the show uh, with only 556 yeah. ratings. It's just, it's just so sad because this game is so much fun. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a lighthearted party game, but a fun one. It's a positive <laughs> lighthearted party but game. A fun one. Sorry. No, no offense to fans of party games out there anywhere. <laughs> Well, there are certain card-based party games out there that I think people true. know what I'm talking about. Very this true. one is a positive, enjoyable <laughs> game where you're not putting things down and putting people down and, and insulting okay. people. It's just a I'll give it fun, you. happy game. Yeah, this is one, even the publishers, if you are interested in publishing a game, although I probably the reason no one's interested is it only has 556 <laughs> ratings. And I don't know how positive those ratings are. Uh, the, the one caveat with this, this is a pitch game. You are giving cards. You then have to improv with them and give a pitch. That is definitely not for everyone. We have someone sitting in the room with me right now that absolutely hates the game, but loves watching us play. And, and that, that was, that, but wait, there's more. And that's Jay Cormier and Sen Fu Long Lim uh, yes. as the designers on that one. Which you can go to Breakout Con next weekend to meet Sen. I don't know if Jay's going to be there. Back then, they were known as the Bamboozle Brothers. All right, next I have the most popular game on the list, and I don't get it. So this is Hyperborea. This is a game where you look at the the cover of the box, and you think, a Dungeon Quest, Sword and Sorcery, I'm going to make a fighter, and I'm going to go kill monsters, and I'm going to roll dice. And the problem is that is not at all what this game was about. This was the first big Euro bag builder before even Orléans, where yes, you are playing a character, but your stats are represented by cubes and you're using them to move around a map and discover cities. And there's only one type of monster in the entire game. And it just represents there's monsters in this region. This is actually a fantasy 4X bag builder that I think is amazing. And I'm shocked by the number of people who have reviewed it on Board Game Geek and my only reason I can figure out is because no one talks about this game in North America because everyone in North America who bought it was disappointed because they wanted Descent 3 and instead got this heavy Euro 
Like this is our friend Neil, the Euro gamers, one of his favorite games. This is a great game. And I think all of those ratings are from wherever the game was published in Germany or whatever, because it's no one over here talking about this game. I only know one other person who owns a copy of this game. And the only reason they own it is we were in a game store when it was going out of business. And the guy running the store said, you can take anything you want, 20 bucks each. And I handed a copy to Neil and said, you want this. And he looked at it and went, doesn't look like our kind of game. I'm like, no, trust me, you want this. Hyperborea to me is a huge hidden gem. Still available. I double checked. This one's on Amazon right now. You can still get it, but you will never, ever find the expansion, which stinks. Yeah, and and what I what I see is that when I when I do a quick scan through the comments, uh, there is a lot of hate from Americans. Yes, uh, <laughs> because it's not a. It yeah. looks like an Ameritrash sword and sandal romp, and it's not. And yet it won. It was nominated for Golden Geek Best Strategy Board Game, International Gamers Award, General Strategy Multiplayer nominee. Uh, it it was big in some places somewhere not <laughs> just here That's, not in north america yeah just not here uh, i think like they, how can a hidden gem be a, a, a award nominated but same even when i try to bring this one out i'm like hey you want to play this everyone's like oh cool and then i'm like oh no 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 that's not what it is yeah the the box the box art uh interestingly yeah. i think really lets this one down uh as it gives some false impressions and uh unfortunately totally agree we go and that was hyperborea now, next up is one that, again, I, I seem to do all the ones that we sing of praises of. Uh, but, again, it's a fantastic game, and it has gotten a little bit of love out there. And this is The Climbers, uh, with just over 3,000 people rating it on Board Game Geek. But I've never seen people talk about it. I've never no. seen it anywhere except on our own table. Uh, and this is, and I think part of the problem is people think it is a dexterity game and there is a lot of uh i will say uh dislike for dexterity games out there in some people in some places they know people who don't think it's a real hobby game they want more more euro or more dice based and mm -hmm. and, and don't want to have to deal with the dexterity let alone the fact that there are certain people out there who have issues uh which make dexterity games problematic this isn't mm -hmm. a dexterity game other than the fact that you have to move pieces yes. um but there, there is no actual dexterity aspect to the game. It's simply a, a interesting three dimensional puzzle uh, that, that looks great on the table plays fun is incredibly frustrating to, to <laughs> sort of think about it and, and work on uh, and is uh, downright impossible once you get about a beer or two in you. So <laughs> that is the climbers. My final one for our main list is something I only recently found out. I think it was on our 2002 list, not necessarily of new discoveries. And that is Spell Smashers. This is a fantasy RPG. It's kind of the opposite of Hyperborea. This, this is a fantasy RPG where you are smashing and killing monsters by spelling words. This is a, a game where you're going to get a set of consonant cards, a set of vowel cards, and you're going to try to fill, uh, form the biggest word possible, but also taking into account the different elements and vulnerabilities and weaknesses that the monster you're attacking is. Uh, the person who delivers the killing blow is going to get money, which will let you buy more cards, as well as equipment that gets you do things like have, um, you know, uh, wild cards and things like that. This is a fascinating game. I am not usually a big fan of spelling games. Not that I have a bad vocabulary. It's just the fact I usually play with my wife and my daughters who have fantastic vocabularies. And because you're dealing with a limited hand of cards, I find that levels the playing field. It's not just about spelling the biggest word possible. It's also about them finding those interactions and being limited to a set number of cards. Only 525 people have rated this, which blows me away. This is from a huge studio. This is Renegade Game Studios. This is not someone's small publisher that threw this game out there. And it just, it just didn't take off. And I mean, to me, this game should be in like every grade school out there. Yeah. I mean, this is a fantastic uh, learning game that, you know, it's, it's a fun hobby board game that has a significant teaching aspect like this is one of those those hidden gems where you there's no reason to find it in the scholar's choice teacher's store hidden away mm -hmm. no no this is something you're going to find in your flgs and still belongs in schools yeah totally agree so that was spell smashers now we've got a few uh honorable mentions as well 
All right, number one, every time I was asked this question for a number of years, the number one game I would mention is Agizia. Uh, this has 5.4 hits, at least on the old edition. I don't know if the new edition's lumped in with this edition now. The second edition's a completely different game in a way, though. So uh, this is one that I used to talk about. I'm like, everyone's got to play Agizia. Every time I had a, a party at my house, a birthday, or um, New Year's Eve, I was always showing this game off to people. I still really enjoy this game. But I'm not putting it on the list tonight because Stronghold Games finally picked it up. They republished it. They tightened it. They made it more streamlined and easier to play. But then also to keep fans like me happy, they included the original game on the other side of the board, which was, I thought, a fascinating way to do it. Now, I have my old copy, so I didn't pick up this new copy. So I think it's fantastic. It's out there, but I couldn't talk to if it improves the game or doesn't. So because of that new energy that came out for the game i started to see people talk about this game again so to me it doesn't fit on the list though i will say i'm starting to not hear anyone talk about it again so maybe it's going to fade back into obscurity so the new one from stronghold is agizia shifting sands yes uh and it's only it's got 1.1 1. 1, uh thousand ratings uh which for a game from 2019 isn't that bad I mean, no it's, it's not, not. not a great time time to be putting out a game so if you still manage to get a thousand ratings that's uh that says a little something. Yeah, so it's up to like 7 thou now, which is better. So at least it's still out there. There is some buzz. Maybe if we redo this list in a couple of years, it'll be back on there because no one will be talking about it again. And that was uh, next, Yeah. Next, I have Euphoria. Build a better dystopia. Okay, like 10,000 people have rated this. So no, it wasn't a hidden gem. This was a big deal. People love this game. The thing is, it's from Strong... Or not Stronghold Games. I've written down from a Jamie Stegmeier... It's one of his early games, one of his first games, and it's just overshadowed. Stonemeyer has put out such classic games now and big hits and games everyone's talking about between Wingspan, um, Tapestry, and Scythe. No one is talking about Euphoria anymore. Like It's kind of like it disappeared off the planet. Whenever everyone goes, what's your favorite Stonemeyer game? Everyone's one of those other three in general. No one talks, or maybe Charterstone they'll bring up. No one talks about Euphoria anymore. So I had this on my list, but then when I saw 10,000 people have rated, I'm like, I guess I can't call it a hidden gem. But it just kind of feels like it's completely overshadowed by everything else Stonemaier has done since. I still love this game. It is still one of my top games, but it's just no one talks about it anymore. Yeah, and that, every once in a while, I'll hear people mention it, and the people who do mention it love it. Uh, yeah. everyone who's everyone who seems to have played it has always loved the game but uh again it just doesn't it doesn't come out you know it doesn't hit the table anymore it's it's that, that game yeah. that we used to like way back when and, and we've moved on now is sort of what it seems to be now my last uh hidden gem i wanted to throw out there is i wanted to toss one rpg on the list just because um and that is the game dream park and to me this is the biggest hidden gem role-playing game because it is super niche, and it's a licensed game, and it's from Artel Sorian, so the same stronghold, or uh, Stonemeyer problem of, Artel Sorian makes some pretty well-known games. This is a pretty obscure one from that publisher. So this is a game based on the Dream Park novels, and is the first, it is not the only, I th for years I thought it was the only RPG to this, but it is one of the first games where you play a character who's playing a character. You are playing a visit. Your character is a person visiting the dream park who is then going to go experience a dream park experience playing another character. So you actually have that neat two tiered thing there. And then you go have your dream park and there's a bunch of adventures and it does a lot of great stuff for onboarding players, like having the, the back of the rule book was like perforated with character sheets and all this neat stuff. OK, none of that matters, though, because at its core, this is a simple D6, add your skill, beat a target number system as simple as can be that works as a universal system so that you can do anything in the dream park. I found this to be the best universal system ever made. I enjoy this more than GURPS. I enjoy this more than Cortex. I enjoy this more than using D&D to hack Lord of the Rings. I think this is one of the best universal systems ever published by anyone. This is a game where I ran a running man style. You show up as your, your character and you're about to be dropped into a game and you don't know what's going to happen where you can make any character you want. I ran a game where there was a group was a Power Ranger, a mafioso boss, a Vietnam vet, 
and they and a superhero and a member of the Star Trek bridge crew. They went out together and fought giant mecha in space, Gundam style, and it worked. Like it worked fine. There were no problems doing that. I adore Dream Park, and anytime someone mentions hidden gems, even if we're talking board games, Dream Park is one of the first things to pop into my head. Totally fair. And because again, most people don't even know the novels anymore. Let yeah, alone the true. game. So that's it for our list of hidden gem board games. Now, what's a game you love? that you think deserves more attention comment tell us all about it now we're about to check in with the lobby but before that a quick reminder that we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions click on ask the bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as tabletop bellhop one word 